It was a series of senseless killings that left the whole of France stunned. When 24-year-old Thierry Paulin was apprehended on the 1st of December 1987, he admitted to the murder of at least 21 helpless elderly women. In a series of killing sprees across three years, Paulin, a thief, left behind no witnesses at his crime scenes as he brutally strangled his victims to death. Detectives Jean-Claude Moulet and Claude Peroni had the task of bringing Paulin to justice. We were under immense pressure. The only thing we were afraid of was being on call. In other words, would a phone call wake us up that night? Headquarters calling us about a case, telling us about the killing of an old lady. We dreaded finding more victims every time. Paulin n'est pas un tueur en série. C'est un tueur en chaîne. Le tueur en série est un tueur pathologique. Paulin was not a serial killer. He was a spree killer. A serial killer is a pathological killer who kills to experience a physical or moral pleasure. In other words, he enjoys a terror he inspires in others. The spree killer is different. Paulin was a born criminal. In inverted commas, he was complete riffraff. Attacking a grandmother is a triumph without peril which brings no glory. Attaquer une grand-mère, hein? À vaincre sans péril, on triomphe sans gloire. In a twist of fate, Paulin himself would be dead before the trial of his accomplice, Jean Thierry Maturin, in December 1991. Philippe Bilger was prosecuting. Paulin escaped the trial. Unfortunately, it was AIDS that killed him. And of course, we can lament the fact that the mastermind, the instigator, was never brought to justice. This much is clear. Forgive me for being crude, but the criminal justice system took what was left. In other words, Maturin. Maturin was on trial for the murder of eight women in just over one month during the autumn of 1984. The details of the slayings were shocking, even to Maturin's defense lawyer, Michel Arnaud. The photos and pictures were awful. It was difficult, very difficult. I must admit that when I studied the case files, I made sure that I didn't... I didn't have lunch. I didn't have dinner. I couldn't. I couldn't. The killings always followed the same horrific ritual. Thierry Paulin les, les poussait dans l'appartement en leur tenant la bouche. Thierry Paulin pushed them into the flat, holding their mouths. Jean Thierry Maturin closed the door. And from that moment on, Thierry Paulin hit them to get them to tell them where the money was. Jean Thierry Maturin went to look for electrical cables to tie them up, so Thierry Paulin could tie them up. He went to search the flat. If the victim revealed where the money was, Jean Thierry Maturin went to check if it was there. And in the meantime, Thierry Paulin became incensed and ended up strangling them. This killer's story begins over 50 years ago. Thierry Paulin was born in the former French colony of Martinique in the Caribbean on the 28th of November 1963. His teenage parents split up within days of his birth. His uh, father abandoned he and his mother pretty shortly after his birth and went to France. Thierry remained in Martinique and was effectively brought up by his paternal grandmother, who uh, owned a restaurant and apparently neglected him. He made an attempt to go back to live with his mother, who by this point had remarried and had another family, but he didn't fit in incredibly well with that. In fact, he was a troubled young man. This is a young lad who's being passed from pillar to post. He doesn't have a lot of stability, he doesn't have a lot of routine, and life is quite chaotic. He's somebody who finds that, that he never settles in anywhere, and he never really has a, a sense of belonging. After moving to France, Paulin joined the army, 
but he was reportedly picked on for being of mixed race and a homosexual. In 1984, the 21-year-old moved to Paris. When he left the army, he went to live with his mother and he, he got a job at a, an entertainment venue that had a reputation for transvestite performers. And he, he joined in with this. I think this was uh, the first time in his life when he really felt a, a sense of belonging. And Thierry was homosexual and he developed a, a relationship with, with a man he met at, at this place. Paulin's new lover was 19-year-old Jean-Thierry Maturin, the like-minded couple had aspirations of performing on the stage, and they also shared a passion for dressing in drag. I think if we look at his relationship, being homosexual in France at, at this time still carried quite a, a, a significant degree of, of social stigma. So even though he's found his, his place in the world, other people are still judging him, and I think that's something that is always going to trouble him. The couple began living together in a hotel called the Laval. The flamboyant pair had become addicted to drugs and weren't living within their means. It was the world of nightlife. They were invited to all the big Parisian parties. There were transvestites, people who loved to dress up. So they put on a real show. I think they really loved each other. I think there was real love there. But as part of that, Paulin dominated his partner, which explains a lot the influence in Maturin was under. He existed through Paulin. Obviously, I didn't see them in their everyday lives. I didn't see them living together. I didn't see them laughing. I didn't see them in their most intimate moments. But I think it's clear that Paulin dominated Maturin and gave him the drugs he needed. As so often in life, and that's also true for criminals, there was a strong one and a weak one in this couple. And the weak one was dragged into a life of crime by Paulin during these atrocities in 1984. That much is clear. To pay for their lavish lifestyle, Paulin, with Maturin in tow, turned to crime. Each case, the motive was straightforward, money. Maturin and Pauline wanted to have a good time. They wanted to go out, they wanted to party, they wanted to go to nightclubs, they wanted to indulge their appetite for drugs, they wanted to wear different clothes, they wanted to be acknowledged as homosexual, and they were intent on having as good a time as possible. It was a spree, without any doubt, and a spree of the most murderous kind. We had two criminals, under the influence of drugs, who were completely remorseless and were looking for money, who laid waste to the scenes of their crimes carrying out the worst kind of atrocities on these unfortunate old ladies. The old women were coming back from either the post office or the market. They came back with food and bread, etc., and which was found scattered on the floor in the doorway. It was child's play to push open the door and enter behind them, and then to subject them to mental and physical torture. The attacks were shocking in their brutality. The killers ripped off their victims' clothes, burnt their feet and even smashed a wine bottle over one lady's head. Another was suffocated with a mattress and in the most extreme case, 84-year-old Alice Benaim was forced to drink cleaning fluid. Something like drain cleaner, the main effect it has on the human body is that it is corrosive. So it will cause chemical burns to the mouth, tongue, the lips, and then if it's swallowed, it will cause chemical burns in the esophagus and the stomach, can potentially cause perforations, and if the fumes get into the lungs, they can set up a chemical reaction there, causing fluid on the lung and all sorts of potentially lethal consequences. One victim was Alice Benaim. To tell them where her money was, 
Paula and Machova forced her to drink a product used for unblocking sinks. You can only imagine the suffering to make her reveal where she had hidden her savings. One of them used to hide her savings inside her corset. She had pockets full of money. The way they made them talk was by twisting their fingers. It was to make them suffer. During this two-month spree, the horrific murders sent shockwaves across the country, especially in the Montmartre district of Paris, where the majority of the crimes had taken place. I believe that what really struck public opinion was that the killer was targeting old, vulnerable, defenseless people. I believe that's what had the biggest impact on the public. There was no comparison between one murder and the next. It was the fact that these were defenseless people who were being killed. People were stunned, asking, why don't they arrest them? The public wanted justice, but detectives were struggling to find any suspects. And the longer it went on, the fewer facts we had, because everything had been tried to find them. All of the investigations had been done from our perspective, but the luck factor was missing. You have to see that with the atrocity and repetitiveness of the crimes, as well as the fact that there were no central police files at the time, that there was a general feeling that they wouldn't be arrested, and that created a real panic amongst the public.